the channel. Uh, just today alone, 11 dinghies carrying 550 people arrived in Dover. Last year, it was ruled that the Rwanda plan was unlawful under the European Convention on Human Rights. The government, this government anyway, has bet the house on Rwanda. Bearing in mind that the capacity for some people in to, to Rwanda is actually not that high, so it has to work as a short, sharp deterrent. But it has reopened the debate about whether or not we should quit the ECHR. We've covered a lot today. We've spoken about the legalities as to whether or not we can turn boats back. We have spoken, of course, uh, about how many people have absconded from hotels. We've spoken about how our European friends treat asylum seekers versus us. It is now time to get stuck into whether or not we could actually leave the ECHR. What would that look like? How would we do it? I'm joined now by a barrister, writer and housewife's favourite. It's Stephen Barrett. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, uh, could we leave the ECHR? How could we do it? What would happen? This is a really easy question, because the short answer is yes. Okay. And within our constitution, the answer is always yes. And ever since we left the EU, the answer has been yes. And even when we were inside the EU, the answer was yes, although it was more slightly more complicated. Law is not here to block policies that the, the public want or that politicians want. That is not our job. What happened is a certain branch of law that when I was little, when I was young, I was taught it as an administrative law. That was its title. It was, it was admin. Okay, and it was about dotting I's and crossing T's and judges making sure that politicians had, had enacted the policy in a way that fit within the legal system, didn't cause any issues with the, with the general operation of the machine, mm. if you like. And it's morphed into something, it now calls itself public law, and it takes itself terribly seriously. And it really likes to tell politicians and journalists that they can't do things. And that's just wrong. Okay. So we're, we are perfectly free. There are two difficulties that I can see if we do want to uh, leave the ECHR, but uh, I'll start with the easiest one if you want. Yep. That the uh, trade and cooperation agreement with the EU. There are promises in that that we will uphold human rights. Now, if you can't get the, the UK, so my job as a barrister, and actually I had this earlier, I got a case in and I wrongly thought I was for one side and I was going through all the evidence thinking, oh, well, I'll do this and I'll do this and oh, I might win this, might be a good point. And then about halfway through, I realised actually I was for the other side. So then I just instantly switched and turned on a pin and now I'm yeah. like, oh, well, I'll win this and this is how I'll win for this. And that's what, that's what I consider a proper lawyer does. You do what your client wants. So any international lawyer who is acting for the UK or acting in the UK's interest could definitely get us out of the ECHR without breaching the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU. Not least of all, because the EU is currently in massive breach of that section itself. It's got something called the EU rule of law crisis, and it's being, res and it's being held responsible for, for nearly, well, over 100,000 deaths of migrants because of how the EU is responding to the crisis. I'm glad to see other, um, other people on your show have pointed out it is an, it's an international crisis. And the EU's response to it is so bad that it, it is ca characterised as human rights abuse, it's been criticised by the UN. So the idea that the EU isn't in breach of this, this bit of the TCA is, is completely for, for the birds. But, but a competent lawyer could easily get us out of the uh, EU and maintain the TCA. The other one is the Good Friday Agreement. And again, the wording of the... the just, just think about it logically. The Good Friday Agreement is a treaty, but it's, it's an international... It's an act of diplomacy. So the wording is incredibly woolly. It's not like when I draft a contract. It's really quite vague. And the main point of it was not to keep everybody in the ECHR. The main point of it was to bring peace and reconciliation to Northern Ireland. So it, they weren't at the time in the 90s sort of thinking, oh, we, we'll need this in future to keep everybody inside the ECHR. Again, a basically competent international lawyer could get us out of the ECHR without harming the Northern Ireland um, the, 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 the Good Friday agreement in, in, in any way. So th those are the only two real obstacles as law, and I think they both fall. And, and would it be wrong to say that by pulling out of the ECHR, Britain is running a risk of damaging human rights? Do we have to be any worse at protecting human rights if we're out of the ECHR? Can we just do things differently? We can, we can do things differently and do them here. It's 14 years ago since the EU promised in its treaty that it would join the ECHR, and it's never fulfilled that promise. 
So if, if, if anybody's harming human rights by not joining the ECHR, it's the EU, because they, they've been ignoring their obligation to join it. They, they won't join it for very sensible reasons. That they think that it interferes with their sovereignty. Well, it does interfere with your sovereignty. And we, it's important to look, because I'm not te on here telling you to leave the ECHR. Yeah. That's not my job and my role. I do not adopt a policy position. I, I'll tell you that you can. I think it's important to analyse the court for its basic competence. You know, look at these judges and who and who they are. There are 46 of them. One of them is from San Marino. Now, San Marino has a total population of 35,000 people. What, why is the United Kingdom benefiting from this judge? When and, and you saw it, its utter incompetence at work over the Rwanda plan, because it didn't. The United Kingdom government, when it issued that injunction which, by the way, I don't think it has the right to issue injunctions, but that's another, another story. But when it issued that injunction, it, it didn't let the UK government say anything. The UK government wasn't told in advance. They went in the courtroom. That's just basic incompetence. If I'm running a court and I'm going to issue an injunction it's against the government, it's going to have massive... I, I might ask them to turn up or at least tell yeah. them that I'm going to do it. Just vague... Very competent. They didn't tell us the name of the judge, and quite rightly, I mean, of course, it took them six months to get rid of the Russian judge. So everybody immediately suspects it's the Russian judge. <laughs> and there are there are nations. I mean, you only need to look at how the UK fares in yeah. Eurovision to then well, do a cross sectional analysis of the nationalities yeah. of these judges and go, do you really want them with ultimate control do, of your legal system? It, we've turned we our legal system into in Eurovision. I love I love that I love that, that analogy. We've turned we've turned we've decided that our legal system has to be judged in the same way that Eurovision is judged. We've seen how well that has gone for us, apart from the one year that we were robbed by Ukraine, but we're not allowed to say that because of the, the war in Ukraine. But we were robbed by Ukraine, uh, and, and now we've decided that we want to have our, our asylum policy uh, drawn up by... Look, Stephen, thank you very, very much. As ever, absolute delight. Stephen Barrett there, barrister, writer for The Spectator, and I'll say it again, housewife's favourite. Now, on a big day in the...